We have a special guest today, and uh, he's all the way from Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, you guys may have seen him on Duck Dynasty from A&E, uh, 11 seasons. He is also a Vietnam veteran. His son uh, did three tours in Iraq. And so, yeah. So he's come this morning to share some stories with us, to share his faith with us today. Uh, would you stand on your feet and give Cy Robertson a great grace welcome. They told me you needed a little help. I needed help? Yeah. So I brought you help. Wow. There's a nice duck call. Okay. We're going to make a duck hunting man out of you yet. All right. It's a signed duck call from... <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. So the next time... That's I actually could... the high dollar one, too. That's the high dollar one? Yeah, that's the high dollar one. Okay. That's Thank a good duck call, though. Thank you very much. I put the read in that. So when we draw those connect cards and somebody wins a duck call, they're not going to win this no, one. No, they don't get that. That's for you. This is mine. Thank you very, very You're much. You're welcome. Appreciate that. All right. All right. Grace Assembly, it's a pleasure being here. All right. So, uh, Uncle Cy, thank you uh, for joining with us. This, I think you said, told me yesterday, this is your second time in Indiana? I think so. So we're going to make you an honorary Hoosier, everybody. <laughs> Uncle Cy. I don't know if I can pull that off. All right. <laughs> okay, so a uh, couple questions. Uh, we posted on social media. What's some questions that uh, we should ask Uncle Cy? Probably one of the most popular was, how much tea do you drink per day? My wife actually cooks up two pots, one in the morning, okay, and one in, in the evening. I drink two gallons. Okay, and I tell, them, I tell them, I'm like a fine-tuned race car. Wow. After about 50 laps, I got to pull in for a pit stop. <laughs> That's pretty good. So is it sweet or unsweet? Unsweet. Okay. Oh, no, the last time I ate, if I, if, you know, I'm crazy enough with unsweet. If I had sweet tea, yeah, I'd be bouncing off the wall. All right. Okay. That's good. And, uh, of course, people who've watched this show, you see you interact with your family. Tell us who your favorite nephew is of all of the nephews. You've got Willie, you've got Jep, you've got what? Jace was here two years ago uh, here in our church. So, uh, Jason, you... Jason's definitely out. He's out. Okay. Okay. We, I call him the fun sucker. Okay. You can't have no fun with him duck hunting. Okay. And Al... Al's a, uh, he's the instigator. He's the smartest one of the bunch, Al is. Because okay. he's the preacher. Yeah, he's the preacher. Well, I don't know if that has anything to do with uh, being the smartest one of the bunch. <laughs> That's stretching a little too much. I appreciate it. But Jeff, okay, Jeff's the baby boy, okay, so then, you know, and uh, Duck Dynasty gave Willie a, a bad rap, okay, because he, He's portrayed on the show as the bad, hard-nosed CEO, just work, work, work. He's the worst prankster we got in the family. Okay, so Willie's my favorite. Because wow. the fat little boy can take a joke. Okay, because I'm always poking him. He, he reminds me of the Pillsbury Doughboy. Okay, the fat little CEO of Duck Commander. Wow. So if we have Willie here in the future, some, we're going to have to play that one back. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, so we've got copies of your book that you have signed, by the way, uh, for sale at the end of the service. So uh, you can pick this up. It's called Sirenity, and uh, this is a great book about how I stay calm and keep the faith. Now, I read this this weekend, very good, full of all kinds of stories, and so just want to encourage everybody to pick this up. This is going to be great. Give them a reason to get the book. A&E, a &E, okay, was on me for the, about the first two years. R Willie wrote a book, and it went to number one. Phil wrote a book, it went to number one. So we're in New York City, 
you know, Willie comes back, you know, on one of his trips and he, you know, tells Phil and me, you know, we're, the, we're kind of the lost sheep of the family, I guess, you know, because every time we go out, we always get in trouble. If Phil goes out, he gets in trouble because he says something that he shouldn't have said. And if I go and out, that's I'll, not going to happen today with you, right? You're oh, not going to say something. Yeah, it probably will. Okay. Because, look, I went to New York one time, and I got in trouble. I was, uh, I had a little bit part in a movie, Faith of Our Fathers. It was two young men that was trying to find out their fathers got killed in the Vietnam War, and they was trying to find out, you know, well, who really was my father? You know, they wanted to know about their dad. So uh, they brought me in for comedy relief. But anyway, they had me in front of a green plastic thing, okay, and I had about 40 different stations calling in and interviewing me. And I don't even remember what, what came up about it, but the word atheist come up. That's the person that don't believe in God. You know, so I said, uh, no, nah, ain't no such thing. You know, so the next day, the New York Times paper comes out, and it says, Uncle Si says there's no such thing as atheists. So I've got people outside this station we're at protesting, you know. So look, I spend my days there, you know, and I explain to them. I said, well, let me explain. Since I've made the statement, there's no such thing as ISIS. I said, you got two men in the military. I said, okay, one of them's a very religious man, and the other one is a so-called claimed atheist, don't believe in God. And I said, they're in a foxhole together, and here comes the enemy, and they're fixing to overrun this camp and kill everybody there. And I said, and here's the conversation between the two men and someone. The religious man says, Father, you need to help me. I'm in a bad situation here. Then the Asian is going, he's looking around, and he's saying, I need some help. Well, I, the difference, at least the religious man knows who he's asking to help him. You know, the atheist is an idiot because he don't even know who he's asking. <laughs> uh, so, look, I come back to Duck Commander, and as soon as I walk in, the receptionist says, well, he did it again. And I said, what? How did I get in trouble this time? She said, hey, look, I don't even want to hear it. Go see the boss. <laughs> you know, so I walk in, and Willie said, you got, you're getting just like Dad. We can't send you nowhere without you get in trouble. I said, well, hey, here's the news flash to you. Why do you keep sending me to New York if I get in trouble every time I go up there? I said, you're supposed to be in charge of this company. You better have more sense than that. Yeah. That's really good. So, in other words, they should get the book. Uh, yes, the book. No, it's actually a good read, okay, because they finally, after two years, they convinced me we was in New York again. Okay, and I got in trouble, of course, again. But a guy sat down with him, and he said, hey, he was the book man. And he said, Si, Uncle Si, you need to write a book. I said, look, I've lived my life. It's not that, that's not that entertaining. He said, trust me. He said, Willie wrote one. It went to number one. Phil wrote one. It went to number one. He said, trust me when I tell you this. You write one, you'll outsell both of them. And, hey, I wrote it, and I outsell both of them. So it is actually a good read because, look, I tell my life story, okay, in tales, you know. Because, like, when I was in school, I never did give a book report. You'd have to read a book, you know, Tom Sawyer on the Mississippi River. I read it, you know. I get up there and sit down and I start telling me, okay, Tom Sawyer and old Uncle Jim was on the Mississippi River, you know, and all the kids in the class said, hey, look, teacher, Miss Jones, we don't want to hear all that junk. We've all read Tom Sawyer. Him and Phil skipped school last Thursday. We want to know what he did Thursday. <laughs> you know, so I look at my teacher and say, okay, what about it? She said, hey, just know this. I'm great you on this story. So I said, okay, it's wintertime, okay? We get up, start getting dressed for school, and Mom says, nope, you ain't going to school today. I'm fish hungry. Go up there on the old river and catch me some white perch. Did you say crappie. fish hungry? Yeah, fish hungry. Okay. So look, we wait. Mickey blows, you know, Mickey, our bus driver, she blows up and stops in between the pathway. We had a shrubbery, you know, I had a path to walk through. She blows the horn, Mama waves around, you know, we're there at the window looking, you know. 
As soon as she goes around the car, we jump in the car and head to the river. You know, look, it's wintertime. 35 mile an hour northwest wind. Cold, okay. We're going crappie fishing. We go up there, we got cane poles and shiners. There's no trees in this old river. They're all dead from the water up coming up and down, you know. So, but a first commercial fisherman has stuck a willow limb here and a willow limb there that he ties his net in between. So he pulled up that one stick, throw the shiner in there, and as soon as it goes, pew, boom, pound and a half copy. Well, we do this three times. But every time by when we get the fish and by the time we get it all, by the time we rebait up, we're 300 yards down the lake. That 35 mile an hour northwest wind is rough. So we paddle back up there and Phil says, hey, guess what? I said, what? He said, you're the youngest. You're going to have to be the three-horse motor, and you're going to have to hold me right here at this stick. So look, he throws in there. I hold him there, and he catches 75 more crappie. So we had six to begin with, 75, that's 81. So I tell her, okay, I said, Miss Jones, 85 or 81 pound and a half white perch. You know, mom's happy. We got fish fry and we had a big fish dinner. And she said, I'll give you a, a C minus. I jump up off the stool and said, woman, have you lost your ever loving mind? 81 crappie in a 35 mile northwest wind. I said, that leads to A plus. <laughs> and she said, I'll give you a B minus. I said, deal. <laughs> All right. So there's lots of great stories uh, in the book, and you've got a lot of great stories. Would you tell us uh, the story about your mom being on The Price is Right? Yeah. Okay. How, Jimmy Frank's my oldest brother. How's the next under Jimmy Frank? Him and Mary, his wife, you know, they said, hey, we're going to California, you know, and uh, if we can get in, we're going to go to the Bob Barker show. You know, Mom said, well, you know, I watch that show all the time. I need to go with y'all, and maybe I'll get on it. You know, so they go, and sure enough, I didn't know this, you know, <laughs> outside the Bob Barker Stadium where they filmed this thing, wherever it's at, you know, they, all the contestants or all the people line up to come in. And Bob Barker actually comes out and interviews a few of them to pick the ones he wants to actually call down and say, come on down, you don't have a chance to win a prize. So he likes mom. So they get in there and they call her down, Mary Robertson, come on down, you know. So she comes down. Well, unbeknown to Bob, dad and mom watch that show every time it's on. And look, they both are into this, okay? So they bid on the showcase, you know. I bid, you know, $3,573, you know. That's mom. You know, dad says, ah, that's a little better, bigger, higher than that. You know, I'll bid 5000 You know, you lose, James, you know, Merritt wins. You know, they argue about it all the time at the house, you know. So mom gets on the show, you know, and uh, Bob Barker says, Merritt, what you've got here is you've got seven items at the grocery store. And if you pick the correct cost of it, you have a chance to win, you know, this showcase. A car and, uh, you know, a uh, stereo or whatever, you know, with the car and all this stuff. You know, so, so she starts, I mean, okay, he said, uh, shampoo, bottle of shampoo. What does it cost, Mary? She said, Bob, it costs three ninety nine. You know, they flip it down, three ninety nine. Oh, Bob looks at mom, you know, and tells him, hmm, that's pretty good, one for one. You know, next, next item, Mary, okay, a saltine box of saltine crackers, you know. You know, what does that cost, Mary? That's $1.98, Bob. Boom, $1.98. Well, she just keeps going. The whole set of items, she's not close. Everything she said, you know, flip it down, that's what it costs. You know, well, Mary, she win it. She won both showcases. You know, she comes home, she gives Al and Lisa the uh, Volkswagen convertible that she won. There was something else that she won, you know, gave that away, you know. But, hey, she's been playing this all her life, okay? She was 84 at the time, which was pretty cool. Pretty awesome. So you, you get all of your skill from her. Yeah. Me and Mom were like this. I'm the baby boy. I had one sister that was younger than me. She was the baby girl. 
I was a baby boy, and I always caught, you know, my whole, all of my, I had four older brothers. You know, they mistreated me badly. Of course they did. Yeah. And all the youngest said amen. That's right, yeah. That's right. And hey, and the reason they mistreated, they knew I was mom's favorite. <laughs> all right. Well, the Bible says to confess your sin, so that's a good thing. All right, and then there's a fantastic story about a vacuum cleaner salesman that came to your house, right? John. The, you know, John showed up. I have to give this. He was a salesman, and he was selling Kirby vacuum cleaners, okay? But, you know, most people, if you tell them two or three times, no, nah, they're gone. No. Nah. John's very, let's say he had, uh, he had perseverance, okay? For like three weeks, every day at 10 o'clock, Mama would walk up and say, yes, may I help you? Uh, Ma'am, what is your name? Uh, be Miss Merritt Robertson. Oh, okay. Well, Miss Robertson, uh, I'm a salesman. She said, I'm not interested. For whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. You know, he said, wait a minute, you, ain't even, you don't even know what I'm selling yet. She said, you don't understand. I'm married, and I've got seven kids. Okay, and my, my husband, he's at oil, he works in the oil field, which he don't make much money, so no, I'm not buying anything. He said, no, no, you need to give me an hour of your time and let me demonstrate this vacuum cleaner for you, and I guarantee you, you'll buy it after I demonstrate it. She said, number one, I'm trying to save you and me time. I'm not buying this stupid vacuum cleaner. You know, you've done told me it cost over $1,000. Hey. I don't even have a penny to give you, son. So, no, I ain't going to buy it. Look, so, hey, he goes away. Next morning, about 10 o'clock, same thing. They done got on the first name basis. Mom walks out and says, John, what are you doing here again? <laughs> yeah, he's mad. I'm trying to, I want to sell you this vacuum cleaner. She said, John, I've already told you I'm not buying this stupid vacuum cleaner. It's too high. Yeah. So, finally, hey, three weeks go by, last time, 10 o'clock. John, what is wrong with you? I'm not buying the vacuum. Merrick, give me, give me five minutes. I'm not giving you five minutes. I ain't buying that stupid vacuum. Give me three minutes. Okay, let me get this right. If I give you three minutes for you to demonstrate this stupid vacuum cleaner, you'll leave and I'll never see you again, right? And we're going to shake hands on this. Okay, and he said, yes, ma'am. If you give me three minutes and, you know, I'll leave. She said, okay, go get the stupid vacuum cleaner. So John goes out to this beat-up old van, okay. Takes him five minutes to get the bent doors open. He grabs a vacuum cleaner and a five-gallon bucket, walks in, goes to the wall socket, plugs the vacuum cleaner in, grabs that bucket, and he starts walking around dumping something out on the rug in the living room. And what he's dumping is horse manure. And Mama screamed, John, have you lost your mind? What are you doing? Mary, 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 don't worry, don't worry. Uh, I'll clean it up. She said, hey, look, I broke the broom, okay, so you ain't no have And he, she said, well, you'll have to eat it. And he said, well, okay, Mary, I'll eat it. You know? She said, well, I hope you're hungry because we've been out of power for the last three days. <laughs> well, needless to say... We never saw John again. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's one way to do it. All right. So uh, there's another story about uh, the time you may or may not have driven a monster truck. This is a good one. All right. Okay. I told you Willie got a bad rap by the show. He's the biggest prankster in the family. So look, we'd filmed that day. I can went home, sit down around recliner, and the phone rings. Yeah, ring, ring. Hello. <clears throat> the voice at the other end, it sounds like it's being disguised. It said, uh, this is Mr. Slim with monster trucks. And I said, nice try, Willie. Bonk. <laughs> yeah, well, the phone rings again. I pick it up. Hello. And the voice on the other end said, hey, Uncle Si, please don't hang up. Don't hang up, sir, please. And I said, okay, what? He said, this is Slim with monster trucks. I said, you mean like the, the Grave Digger monster truck? He said, yeah, that's one of my trucks. And I said, well, 
Number one, how'd you get my phone number? It's unlisted. I said, oh, never mind. I said, what do you want? He said, I want you to come down here and drive one of my monster trucks. And I said, wait a minute. Is this for real? He said, it's for real. I said, I'll be down there about 10, 15 minutes. I said, where are you at again? He said, Monroe Civic Center. I said, I'll be there about 15 minutes. So I called my handler, okay? My family won't let me go out alone in public. <laughs> Why, I don't know, but they don't. Okay. So look, I called my handler, Philip, told me, hey, come get me. He said, what are we doing? I said, don't worry about what we're doing. Just come over to the house, pick me up. we go got somewhere to go. So he finally comes over, picks me up. They get him on the phone and tell him, okay, hey, look, come on to the Civic Center in the back way, and we'll be there to meet you. You know, you know Slim, the monster truck owner, and Joey's is the right-hand man. So we pull in, we get out and meet each other, you know, and Philip says, uh, Slim, what is Uncle Si going to be doing here tonight? He said, well, here's the deal. We're going to turn the lights out. We're going to have a spotlight on his truck. He'll be in number three, okay? And we got six trucks, and we'll, we're will we going to go around the arena about three times, and then Uncle Si's going to pull up on that dirt berm in front of them 10 crushed cars, and he's going to call out and take his helmet off, and the crowd's going to go crazy. This is what Philip, my handler, hears. He goes, him and John Gimmer, my uh, sister's, boy, okay, they go get in the stands. So I get in the car with, uh, get in the golf cart with Joe, Slim's right-hand man, and we're going towards the truck, towards the, they're parked in the pit down there, and old Joe says, uh, hey, Uncle Si, I said, what? He said, what did the boss tell you to do? I said, oh, I'm going to be number three in line, and all six trucks are going to go around the arena, and then I'm going to pull up over there on that dirt berm in front of them crushed cars, and uh, they're going to put a spotlight on me. I'm going to take my helmet off, and the crowd's going to go nuts. And he said, oh, man. He said, you're Uncle Si. You need to jump something. <laughs> well, hey, me and the drivers had done had a meeting, and they was going away. And I said, hey, guys, hey, change the plan. Come back. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, change the plan. I said, you're not going out first. I am. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to jump in 10 crush cars. <laughs> he said, really? I said, yeah. So the guy had, that had perfected a 360 foot backward flip. He just runs into a wall of dirt. The car runs up the dirt pile and flips over and, you know, he does a 360 lands and, you know, cuts donut stuff. I said, hey, you do this for a living. What do I need to do? He said, Robin, no, it ain't much to it. He said, two of them two dirt berms with the crushed cars in between them? I said, yeah. He said, look, <clears throat> these monster trucks, them tires are eight foot tall. He says, so you got to make a wide turn when you come out of the pit. And he said, not only that, he said, this truck you got cuts incredible donuts. You know, and not only that, it's got a 440 Hemi in it. I said, who? Okay. So they, you know, Philip and my nephew are in the stands, and they see two guys walk out with a 12-foot ladder. Okay, I walk behind them. You know, they see me climb up the ladder. They see me put a fire retardant helmet on. You know, and I crawl in the window and get in the truck. The guys take the ladder away and they disappear. And then, you know, you got to understand, this is a 440 Hemi. So I crank against Bad Bay a bit. And I said, whoa, oh, good grief. I got something here, boys. Ah, I'm looking forward to this now. So I said, okay, so ease out and make a wide turn. So Philip and my nephew are in the stands, and the spotlight, they kill the lights, and that spotlight's on me, and I make a wide turn, and I come out, and I line up on the dirt berm, you know, and the guy told me, he said, hey, once you feel the tires go up the incline, he said, just put it to the floor, and just, uh, he said, I mean, stomp it. Okay, so I line up straight and just tell me, well, as soon as I do that, it's, uh, I'm airborne, and I'm straight at the ceiling, and my chest is, my heart is trying to come out of my chest. Good grief, you know, so I finally, calm down, calm down, calm down. Well, by the time I get settled down, now I'm coming down. 
and I'm like this, and the guy had told me, hey, Robertson, the key to this is once you start coming down from the air, get off the gas. <laughs> Guess what? All my weight's on my foot. I can't get off the gas. <laughs> so they done told me this thing does great donuts, so I'm already spinning the steering wheel. This thing hit, and it bucked about five, six times. And then right when I'm fixing it, I'll just cut donuts and blow it up or turn it over and do something fantastic. He goes, conk, 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 conk. I'm sitting there talking, you piece of junk. <laughs> I said, by one moment of glory, and this stupid truck's got to die. So it takes me about 10 minutes to get unbuckled. I've got, I got buckles everywhere, seat belts on me. You know, so I finally get out 10 minutes later, climb out, take my helmet off, and it sounds like a bad thunder day. Just a roar from the crowd. <laughs> you know, and then I hear this piercing scream that I think it sounds like a woman being tortured. Okay, and it's my handler, Philip McMillan. He's over, and he's got his hands on the pipe, and he's pole vaulting down into the pit where I'm at. And running and screaming, Willie's going to kill me. What are you thinking about, you crazy old man? You know, by that time, he's up against me. And he, I said, what is your problem? And he said, beep, 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 beep on his phone, turns it around, and it's a picture of me in that monster truck in the air. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at Philip, and then I look, and I'm saying, good grief, the stands or the concrete starts about seven foot above my head. Then two more feet, and the, the rows of seats start. And I start counting them. I'm looking at Philip. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'm above the 17th seat, Philip. <laughs> I said, you talking about up there, son? That was a jump. He said, you crazy old man. He said, Willie's going to put me in the jail. <laughs> he said, I'm supposed to be here to protect you. And I said, oh, good grief. But anyway, I didn't know it. The stupid truck didn't die. I scared the owner Slim so bad. He had one of those stupid remote controls. <laughs> Look, if I'd have been next to him, I would have punched his lights out. <laughs> Why, my one moment of glory, and the, and the owner kills it by killing the truck. Wow. I, to say I was a little hot is an understatement. Right. Now, uh, one thing that you say in the book is that all of your stories are 95% true. That's true. I spice it up a little bit just to make it interesting. Okay. The other 5%. That's good to know. Now, there's a, there's a powerful story in the book. When I read it, it, it really made an impact on me. Uh, a 10-year-old uh, boy uh, comes to you. Yep. Was it in Lafayette, Louisiana? right? Yep. And uh, can you tell us that story and the impact that it had on your walk with God? This is uh, one of them, uh, you know, I went to Lafayette, Louisiana, okay? There was about 30,000 people showed up to come see me, okay? It started at 8 in the morning. It's now 1030 at night, Okay. So I tell my handler, okay, well, I've been all day long, I've been taking photographs, signing pictures, talking to the fans, okay, and it's 1030 at night. So I call Philip, I said, hey, cut the line off, you know, and I'm done once we finish what's left in the line. You know, so he goes out, and he comes back in about, <clears throat> about 15 minutes later and talking about, hey, just two more people. And I said, Philip. What didn't you understand about our little discussion a while ago? And he said, no, no, you don't want to see these two. I said, hey, have you forgot you worked for me, for crying out loud? Go out there and tell them, no, I'm done. He said, trust me, grab my leg and tell me, hey, you got to see these two people. I said, I ought to kill you and fire you. But go get them and bring them in. So look, here comes an elderly gentleman and he's got a 10-year-old kid with him, a boy, okay? And the only way I can describe this boy, okay, no hair, okay, 
and he's literally skin and bones. He looked like a Holocaust victim of the Jews that they have photos that, you know, you know, so he looks horrible. He's on death's door, okay? And that's what they tell me. The grandfather says, Uncle Si, this is my grandson. He's dying. He's got stage four cancer. He's got less than a week to live. And he said, if you would, please, you know, would you say a prayer for him? So, you know, there's about 20 people in the green room, okay? There's food out, and, you know, a couple of ladies are vacuum cleaning, cleaning up, you know, and I've got security people all around me and all that, and everybody's talking. So I just say it in a normal tone. I said, hey, everybody come over here. You know, so everybody's still talking, murmuring and all that, and I said, hey, shut the stupid vacuum cleaners off, and everybody get over here. Form a circle, and I said, hey, hold hands. I said, I'm fixing to, me and this young man fixing to walk in the throne room of God Almighty himself, and I'm going to say a prayer and petition him to take this cancer from this young man's body. So I do this, okay, and this ain't a way you want to end an event, okay? So me and Philip go to the airport, get on a plane, four or five hour plane ride. You know, we ain't said a word to each other ever since we met this kid, you know? So that's the way this, this thing ends, we think. Two years later, the kid was 10 years old. Two years later, my nephew, Zach Dasher, Jan's oldest boy, is running for something in Congress. And he comes to say, Uncle Si, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that? He said, I'm running for Congress, and I need to raise some money to help, you know, pay for my campaign. He said, we're going to have a 300-plate dinner out at the famous duck hunting lodge in New Orleans. And I said, sure, I'll do it, you know. Get with Philip and set the dates up and all that. You know, work y'all work it out when I'm supposed to be there and everything. So two years later, I get on a plane, go to New Orleans. Then we get from the plane to go get in a helicopter. And as we're coming into this duck hunting club, you know, beautiful lodge, you know, heliport. You know, we're coming. There's a elderly gentleman and a good-looking young man, looking like Elvis Presley, got a head full of hair, you know. And uh, I've been on this on a plane and a, and a helicopter for about five hours now. So. You know, I tell Philip, hey, I ain't got time to talk with him. I got to make a pit, pit stop. So I go inside. The only way I can describe Philip McMillan's move when he comes in, okay, is like a kid at Christmas time. And he's got whatever he asked Santa Claus for. Because he comes in giggling, talking about, okay, did you recognize the kid? Did you recognize him? I said, Philip, no, I didn't recognize the kid. I see thousands of kids. I don't know. I didn't recognize him. He said, hey. That's that kid from Lafayette. And I said, what? He said, that's that kid from Lafayette that was on death's doorstep. And I said, go get the grandfather and the kid and bring him in here. I want to talk to him. So look, they come in and sit down. I asked the grandfather, I said, okay, tell me what happened after y'all left, after I said the prayer. He said, well, we went to the doctor the next day, and he said, they put him in the machine, they run him through the x-ray machine before you lay down, they x-ray your toenail to the tip of your hair, you know. And, you know, the technician goes in, he does the film, you know, hands it to the doctor. The doctor looks at it and says, hey, you got bad film, te technician, go, go run it again. Well, he does it three or four times. Then he said, no, nope, hey, run it again, you got bad film. The technician finally says, doc, no, it ain't bad film. This kid has no cancer in his body. Yeah. So this is one of them things that uh, a lot of people ask me, says, what, what is the most important thing that the show, Duck Dynasty, did for you? And I said, well, okay, here's the deal. I said, I guess you'd call it uh, weakness in my faith or I have some doubts about some things. I said, watching God do what he does, because look, this happened not only to me. This happened to every member of the Robertson family, mom, dad, kids, grandkids, you know, and it's about 40 of us. So this happened more than like 40 times, okay, is that we, the first time it happened, Make-A-Wish Foundation, 
cancer kid comes up, and, you know, we didn't know how to handle it because here's a kid that's dying, okay? He's been told, the family's been called in, you got less than two weeks to live. And the last thing he wants to do is, his last wish is, oh, I want to meet Uncle Si. You know, we didn't know how to handle that, okay? Al had to give us uh, therapy counseling after the first time we did it because it was a, just a, a, an emotional roller coaster to be involved in something like that. But the thing about what's so great about it is it was an honor and privilege to be involved with something like that and watch God do what God says he can do. Okay? That's, you know, you're talking about 40, 40 more are kids, okay, that the Almighty that day when we said a prayer for him, whoever did it, you know, he just said, yeah. Phil always liked to give it a little, uh, you know, he makes big sounds. He's just like, and it's gone. Yeah, but it's amazing to watch, okay, because I tell people all the time, Silas Merritt Robertson, alias Uncle Si, okay, is living proof that God the Father, His Son, and our Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are alive and they're well, and look, they are doing the most amazing things using the most unlikely people to do what they need done. Last week, uh, we were here, we were talking about Moses and how God, Moses gave all these excuses why God couldn't use him. And uh, we were telling it, encourage everybody that if we make ourselves available, God will make us able. That sounds like what you're saying. No, no, it is. The, it's funny that you say that because I always love, uh, I, I told somebody one time, I said, no, you don't understand. I said, I am a child of I am. Now, if you don't know I am, okay, Moses and the God Almighty is talking when God is telling Moses, you've got to lead my people out of Israel, out of Egypt. You know, and Moses, like he said, he's telling him, no, I'm not qualified. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. But he said, but Lord, who do I say when I go talk to Pharaoh? Who do I say sent me? You know, and he said, hey, you tell him I am sent you. Well, moving fast forward, Jesus, the Son of God, has made his entry into Jerusalem, okay? They arrest him. They give him a mock trial. They beat him beyond recognition of a human being. They nail him to a cross. They kill him. But he had told them before all this happened, you destroyed this temple, and he was talking about his fleshly body. You destroy this temple, and I'll raise it in three days. Well, he did. Okay? But anyway, back to the I am part. Jesus has told us, I am the way, I am the life, and I am the resurrection. Okay? Like Jason always tells me, hey, you can't kill him. The Savior we worship is indestructible. They done killed him once. And look, and he allowed that to happen. Okay? Where I put him up there. My sins, what I do wrong, was partly why Jesus hung on the cross. Okay? But, hey, here's a great part. The cross couldn't hold him. They put him in the ground. The ground couldn't hold him. Okay? The Father resurrected him from the dead. That's why he said, I am the way, I am the life, and I am the resurrection. Well, hey, you can't kill life. He's the author and perfecter of life. Okay, so no, you can't kill him. He's indestructible. Jason is right. Our Lord and Savior, he's the King of kings, he's the Lord of lords, and he's the creator of the cosmos. You know, too much, he's got too much power, okay? You sign uh, all of your books when you autograph them, and all of the books out there are autographed, My by favorite the way. verse. John 3, 
16 and 17. And 17. Now, and why, look, do, why do you include 17 hey, as well? Most people can quote you, okay, for God, you know, send his only one son, you know, that whoever believes in him should not perish. But you need to look at 17 because it's more important. Here's the Savior of the world, okay, and just me, okay, is Jesus qualified to judge? I would say the answer to that is yes, since he's, he was the perfect, sinless human being, okay? Everything he did was perfect. You know, 17 says, hey, I didn't come to judge you. I come to save you. Yeah. Now, how cool is that? I, I got to tell this, okay, in a... In a uh, congregation in Alabama when I lived there, you know, I was teaching the teenagers and my sermon was about who is, who is this man called Jesus of Nazareth and I got to saying all what he is, Prince of Peace you know, the Son of God the Son of Man and I said and then the best part, and I didn't know it one of the elders had snuck in and sit down in the back just to see what I was preaching okay, and I said hey, here's the greatest part I said, he's my older brother. Well, needs to say, after that day, they called me in after church and said, oh, we need to talk to you. And I said, what about? He said, well, uh, you no longer can teach our youth. And I said, uh, what's, what's wrong? What's the problem? He said, well, you brought Jesus down. And I said, whoop, 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 back up. I said, you need to go back to your Bible. I said, number one, I didn't bring him down. He said, yeah, but you said he, you, he was your big brother. I said, well, hey, you need to go to your Bible again. I said, Jesus is the one that said that. He said, I'll be glad to call him brother. I said, he is my big brother. I said, well, he's much more, but I said, he also is my, he, hey, that's God's family. I'm part of it. When I was out doing shows, I told a story one time about, when I did my first sin and I actually come in contact with Jesus. Okay, because most people may not even realize when I believed and was baptized into Jesus Christ, I said, guess what, boys? And I had a doctor involved in this little story and I asked him to show me my DNA. Well, he come back and he just showed me the human DNA. And I said, well, hey, doc, guess what? He said, what? I said, I'm not going to pay you. I said, because you missed it. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I have two DNAs. I've got my mom and dad's DNA. They had me. And then I said, when I become a child of God, guess what? On, when I was God. baptized, I said, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I said, guess what, Jack? I said, that's God's DNA. Come you on. missed it. Hey. So... So, Cy, there's probably people watching online, people in the room today. Some people have been following the Lord for a long time. Some people just, you know, they came because you're here and you're funny and you're famous and you drink tea and things like that. But would you say that the reason God did all this through Duck Dynasty is to give you a platform, all of you a platform, to remind everybody that the most important decision we'll ever make is to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior? You got two things that's really important. First and foremost, okay, you got to have a relationship away with God's family. And that is God the Father, Jesus Christ, His Son, and our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Then the next one is, okay, you got to have an, you know, a family relationship with your family. And here's the thing I need to tell you I didn't tell the, the bunch before. Okay, the devil right now is fooling with mom and dad. They want to get rid of gender. That's why we've got this crazy junk going on in this world right now that they oh, there's 64 different genders that they can call themselves. No, they're not. God created them male and female for crying out loud. It won't work no other way. Okay, and the devil is trying to get us where, hey, if you get rid of mom and dad, well, then you can do whatever you want to be, and you can be whoever you want to be, whenever you want to be. 
Are you talking about a bunch of poppycock? Okay, that's the most ridiculous, stupid thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, there's male and female, okay? There's family. I ask people all the time, because, you know, they have a commercial on now. I used to tell people all the time, what do you do, okay, especially your mom and dad, and you go to the doctor, you take your child to the doctor, okay? And the doctor don't say you have cancer, dad, or mom. Your four-year-old daughter has stage four cancer, and she's dying. If you don't have a strong relationship, who do you turn to? If you don't know God Almighty, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, who do you turn to when you've been hit just in a gut knockdown, you know, where you think you'll never get up? You know, how can I put this? There's nothing in this world more important than having a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? And here's, here's why. Eternity is riding on this. Okay? God created the human being to be a eternal being. We had the tree of life in the garden that we could freely eat of. You could live forever. But guess what? Sinful mankind. Okay. You know, uh, you know, Eve, you know, Adam blamed it on Eve. Eve blamed it on the snake, and hey, he ain't got a leg to stand on. <laughs> you know, it's a joke, but hey, you know, we was talking about me and the law enforcement guys that are taking care of me for this event. Okay. Guys, nothing has changed. This is the same thing from the beginning, from the first tick-tock of a clock, because God's outside of time, okay? But the first second that ever clicked off a clock, it was good versus evil. Nothing has changed. Mankind is still fighting good versus evil. God versus Satan. Hey, if God's, if God's alive and well, okay, uh, do you see evil in this world we live in? Yes. Then Satan is alive and well. And look, he's the prince of darkness. This is his time. But here's the good news. Jesus has done won the war, okay? The victory belongs to us. God made us to be eternal beings, and hey, God has provided, even after we messed up, he still provided a way for us to be with him throughout eternity. But hey, here's the key. You, you've got to come through the one person that makes that all, allowable. And hey, there's, in this deal, there's not but one way to the Father. That's through Jesus Christ, his Son, and our Savior. Okay? Amen. So, if we can be just real transparent with you, the reason we invited Cy to come is so you would come. And so you would come and hear exactly what he's saying, that the most important, the most urgent decision you can make is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you haven't done that, today's your day. Today is your day to surrender your life to Jesus because he loves you. And he wants to invite you to be part of his family. That's what, that's what being a Christian is about. It's not about following a list of activities. It's about being part of a family. Look here. It's very simple, folks, okay? There's not but two commandments, okay? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then, love my neighbor, for crying out loud, as I love myself. Because if I love him, I won't mistreat him. I won't lust after his wife. Okay? This is very simple. Religion, if you apply common sense to religion, it's very simple. Okay? There's two commandments. Love God and then love your neighbor. Okay? The rest of the commandments hinge 
are based upon the first two. They go together. That's just like God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's three of them. They go together. They're one in everything they do. Yeah. And then here, don't forget the prize. You've got eternity riding on this. Okay, I don't know about you, but hey, me and Phil want to hunt ducks for eternity. Look, there won't be no game wardens and there won't be no limits. Yeah. Awesome. Would you, <laughs> would you bow your head and close your eyes if you're watching online? I'm asking that nobody be moving, please. Everybody be respectful of this very sacred moment. If you're not right with God, you haven't given your life to Christ, you don't have a relationship with God like Sai is talking about here today, I want to invite you to make a decision today that beginning today, beginning right now, you're going to surrender. I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. It's a decision that you make. I'm going to follow Jesus. That word repentance means I'm going one way, but I'm, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to begin Change to follow directions. Jesus. It's just a matter of changing directions. If you're ready to do that, would you pray this with me? And I'm going to ask everybody to pray it out loud to encourage those who are praying it for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Would you pray this way? Say, dear God. Dear God. I surrender. I surrender. My life is yours. My life is yours. I confess Jesus Christ. I confess Jesus Christ. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. He died and rose again. He died and lives again. To give me new life. He gives me new life. From this day forward. From this day forward. I'm following you. Following him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you give God praise? All right. I want to I wanna do one more thing before, before we move on. I think if you need a miracle here today, if you came to church... Uh, Sai, you talked about praying for that young man. Maybe there's a sickness in your family. Maybe there's a, an incredible financial need. Maybe your family's falling apart. I don't know. But you need a miracle today. Uh, I'm going to ask Sai to pray for you. Let's pray together. We sang it earlier that God is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. Let's make it more than a song. Let's believe it today. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, that's me. I need a miracle in my life. Would you raise your hand just real high? If you're online, just let them know. I need a miracle. Amen. Come on, let's pray together. Lead us. Father, we come to you now, and uh, here's the bottom line, okay? If you need a miracle in your life, guess what? I can tell you who that is. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of the Almighty God, okay? He is the miracle. You've got to believe that he became flesh for us, that he willingly died on a cross to pay for my sins and yours, okay? But look, death can't hold life, okay? He raised from the dead. He was proved by over 500 people to be raised from the dead. And then a bunch of them watched him bodily ascend to heaven where, look, he's sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God right now. And look, you can't have a better lawyer. Jesus Christ is your lawyer in heaven right now. And every time I mess up, when Silas Merritt Robertson does wrong, all I've got to do is say, Lord, I, I'm sorry. I'm asking for forgiveness. My lawyer says, looks over to the Father and says, hey, put that on my tab. Put that on the cross. Okay? Jesus is the miracle that you are looking for. Okay, trust me when I tell you this. Okay, and here's the thing. I prayed for patience one time. Guess what? My wife become pregnant. Okay, and we had a child. You know, and that's how I learned patience. It wasn't the way I had asked for it. Okay, but the result was the same. I asked for patience. He blessed me with the child, and that child blessed me with patience because I had to learn it bring any her and him up <clears throat> but anyway back to the one that can that can save you okay back to the one that can bless you for you hey you can't even imagine the blessings that the lord can give you 
All you've got to do, though, you've got to be involved in this. You've got to make the decision, okay, I'm going to change my life. I'm going one direction, and it ain't working, okay? I've done, had that direction, and it was without Jesus. Here's my, here's my request to you. Hey, my friend, how about trying it with Jesus, okay? How about giving Jesus a chance, okay? I don't think you'll be disappointed if you give him a chance and you're honestly trying to change your life because if you turn to him and you really surrender yourself to him and he is, he is, he becomes your Lord, okay, and you serve him and you adore him and you learn his ways, okay, because if you've been running with the devil, you're going to have to take the stuff you've learned running with the devil and you've got to get rid of it one, one at a time. If you have rage, get rid of it. Replace it with love. Okay, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta replace it with things. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you're out of control. Well, hey, guess what? Get some of the Spirit. Okay, get self-control. Okay, you don't have any joy in your life. Okay, hey, get rid of all the deadbeat stuff you're doing, and hey, get some of the fruit of the Spirit. Get some joy in your life. But, hey, it's at a cost, okay? You only get what you put into something, okay? Father, our prayer is that if anybody in the range of my voice is that they would, don't put it off, don't put it off. You come to him tonight. You come to him right now. This is too important for the, hey, don't, don't remember the prize that you're after. You want to spend eternity Okay, with God Almighty, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look, they've got an unbelievable life planned for you. The Bible says it plain and simple in Jeremiah. Okay, you don't even you don't even understand the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to bless you. Okay, to give you hope and a future. Okay, you know, and all you've got to do, you've got to change. You've got to submit yourself, okay, and then let the Lord work with you, and you've got to work with him. If anybody's listening, hey, Jesus is the way, he is the life, and he is the resurrection. Without him, there is no hope, okay? And I, I just, when I say that, no hope. If you're in that situation, come to Jesus Christ and he'll give you hope, love, and prosper you, okay? That's his promise. And hey, God Almighty does not lie. Our, our request is that, okay, you will submit to Jesus today. Yeah. And with that, we ask this in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.